what a day! What a lovely day! <laughs> Welcome to the Mad Max Minute Podcast. I'm Rick. I'm Julia. And today we are watching 1974's Stone. So Stone is directed by Sandy Harbutt, written by Sandy Harbutt and Michael Robinson, and produced by Hedon Productions. It stars Ken Shorter as Stone, Sandy Harbutt as Undertaker, Derek Barnes, Hugh Keysburn, Roger Ward, Vince Gill, etc., etc., etc. This Movie is, for all intents and purposes, a lot of people call it the precursor to Mad Max. Like one of the taglines on, I think IMDb or something like that, is before Mad Max, there was Stone. And I think that's primarily because this movie focuses on a cop and a motorcycle gang, and there are hijinks that ensue. I don't really know much more than that. Yeah, that's basically what you get from the trailer. Yeah. <laughs> And um, the trailer itself is pretty off the wall. There's a lot happening. And, I mean, this movie, unexpectedly, really, is two hours and 28 minutes. We're watching a version that was uploaded to YouTube. So hopefully it's the entire movie. But holy cow if it is the entire movie, because I didn't set out to have two really long movies in a row. That wasn't my goal (laughs) when I put the list together of hiatus material. I didn't expect, oh, we'll watch three hours of Mel Gibson and Braveheart and then two and a half hours of every other Australian actor in Stone. (laughs) But I'm not quite sure what to expect from it. I haven't really read up on it. I just kind of get the general sense that we'd be doing ourselves a disservice if we didn't watch this movie. I'm looking forward to it. We went into Vanishing Point blind And that was an excellent movie, and we had a great time. Mm -hmm. So going into this blind, I am very okay with that. We did watch the trailer, which I'm going to play for everybody when we're done talking here before we actually get into movie proper. Uh, I get the sense from watching the trailer that it's kind of got like, and this is terrible of me for making this comparison because one very obviously came out before the other, but sort of a point break style plot to it where the main character stone is pretty much the johnny utah part and you need to infiltrate this gang of criminals to figure out something and then along the way i guess we'll probably become friends with them and whatnot and it's probably more appropriate to say that if my hypothesis comes out right that point break just stole from stone (laughs) (laughs) because stone was the 1970s and point break was the 90s you know, yeah. very disparate time periods for sure. Uh, but yeah, I'm I'm looking forward to it. So uh, should we get started? Yeah. All right. So like I said, we're going to play the trailer for everybody for just like last time. It's going to be a couple minutes for you. It's going to be a couple hours for us. And we'll catch up when the credits are rolling. <laughs> Diggers are on the move. A new breed of motorbike gang. That's why we're here, man. Together. Because when you're out there right, man, with the grave diggers, what can stop us, man? What can stop us? We own the world. They live in a fortress by the sea. Vietnam veterans. With their own style of life. Their own rules. Their own religion. They don't seem to make a lot of friends. But now, somebody wants them dead. All of them. So the cops sent Stone. He's a pig. Yeah, that's right, I'm a cop. I've been sent to find out who's been killing your mates. 
Why would you want to know that? That's the way I earn my living. The whole reason we're outlaws is because we're against pigs. And everything a pig is. So how are we going to do our thing with you pigging around us? Ken Shorter is stone, working undercover on a deadly mission. Sandy Harbert is the undertaker, leader of the grave diggers. Your law sends young blokes to somebody else's country to fight people they know nothing about. As long as you keep on shooting them, they hang medals on you. When you don't shoot them anymore, they suck you in jail. The cop and the bike gang. Two lifestyles clash. In a suspense thriller, you cannot predict. What's the score, man? You got a pro after you. Call it! Go on, man. Look, man, I didn't want any trouble. Well, why don't you do something honest, like sell used cars to old ladies? I'll kill you! You think we're a pack of imbeciles, don't you? I'll kill you! Stone is different. Take the trip. Okay, so let me let me turn this down so we can start talking about it again. Uh huh. Um, first and foremost, the movie is not two hours and forty minutes long. The YouTube video is two hours and 40 minutes long. <laughs> yeah, whoever uploaded it uploaded, like, the second half of the movie again after the movie had concluded. So the movie is really a little over an hour and a half. Yeah. Nowhere near as intimidating and all-encompassing as I thought it was going to be. So. No, it actually went by really fast. Yeah. I was actually about to say how much longer is in the movie because it felt like it was wrapping up, but, but we hadn't nearly gone long enough. Yeah. And then they start the closing credits. I'm like, wait, what? Yeah. Well, I mean, the end comes really fast. So initial reaction, like straight off the end, what do you think of it? I didn't love it. I would say it... I... I am okay having spent an hour and a half watching it. If it okay, if this had gone on for the full two hours and forty minutes, that I would feel I it differently was, about it. Yeah, there are good bits and pieces to it, and I can appreciate it for like the piece of Australian cinema history. Absolutely, I think that that's, it is. I think that's what it has going for it. Yeah. I kind of think that's the only thing that it has going for it. <laughs> no, okay. there, no, there, there, there are still. Plenty of good parts to it. Um, there are good bits. Exactly. It's like... Amongst some boring stuff. Yeah. Like, there are little bits and pieces you can pull here and there that make it an enjoyable watch. Yeah. But yeah, taken on a whole, you know... On a whole, I'm very meh. Yeah. There are some meals that are really delicious to eat. But if you take all of them and throw them in a blender, you might not want to <laughs> drink them. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that's kind of how Stone is for me, just right off the end. Yes. Like, I don't yeah. want to focus on it as a whole. I don't either. I want to dissect it because there are enjoyable bits in within it. Okay. Well, we've done this thing with the last couple of hiatus episodes where we've gone through the plot on the Wikipedia. The Wikipedia plot, yeah. The plot summary, I'm looking at it here on Wikipedia right now, like... Oh, that's not helpful. That's like a paragraph. That's a single paragraph. So let me read through it. Uh, when several members of the Gravediggers Outlaw Mike Motorcycle Club are murdered, Sydney Detective Stone is sent to investigate, led by The Undertaker, a Vietnam War veteran. The Gravediggers allow Stone to pose as a gang member, leaving behind society girlfriend Amanda. Stone begins to identify with The Undertaker and his comrades Hook, Toad, Dr. Death, Captain Midnight, Septic, and Vanessa, The Undertaker's girlfriend. Amid violent confrontations with the Blackhawks, a rival gang, the grave diggers hold responsible. Stone uncovers a political conspiracy behind the killings. When the truth is revealed, Stone must choose between his job and his loyalty to the grave diggers, which is... That is incredibly inaccurate. Oh, yeah. That is a load of crap. So, because it was only an hour and a half, like, I can remember what happened in this movie pretty easily. So, starting back at the beginning, the first scene is 
It's an environmental rally. Yeah, it's a bunch of people in a park, and this one politician dude is up on a stage, and he's talking about how they need to save the environment and clean up the beaches, Mm -hmm. and they can't do that if... I'm Well, I'm assuming they can't do that if, like, a corporation or something builds a new building. Like, it's never explained... It's never explained the motivation behind the assassination. Yeah, because this political guy, speaking at the park, is shot by a sniper. Yeah. Now, the reason this matters to us is because the Gravediggers biker gang shows up to this rally, and one of them, Toad, who was played by Hugh Keys Burn, which, okay, side note, you were really hoping when we were watching Mad Max to get another chance to see Hugh Keys Burn in another role. Yes. And while this was another biker role, I mean, what did you think of him in this movie compared to, like, Toe Cutter? Uh... For the most part, I was uh, unimpressed. <laughs> okay. I mean, it's hard to be impressed compared to the Toe Cutter, because the Toe Cutter is such an impressive person. This is this character was like a step down for him. But there was one scene, it was when they were getting high in the fort. Yeah. Where he did a little bit of monologuing about what it means to be a biker. I was like, yes, that is what I wanted to see him do. That's how I wanted to see him act. It was very satisfying. Yeah, they had some pretty cool, like, drug shots yes. in this movie. But getting back to the plot, so Hugh Keysburn plays Toad, Toad, and Toad starts wandering around because he's tripping on something. Yeah. And he sees the sniper, like, plain as day. I can't identify them. And so the sniper kills the politician. The bikers say, oh, something's going on, and so they all run off. Yep. And somehow this the corporation that hired the assassin on the politics guy find out that members of this biker gang saw Oh, I know this. Okay, yeah. I caught it. Okay. The um so Toad is up on the roof watching the sniper um shoot the politician guy. Yeah. Well, the sniper realizes there's somebody on the roof with him, and after he's done killing the politician, he turns around to kill Whoever's watching him. Oh. Toad is already leaving, and so the sniper the... can't get a good shot. All he sees is the back of his vest with his biker gang logo on it. That explains why they only go after the gang and they don't go after Toad specifically. Right, because they don't know who from the gang saw him, so they're just killing off everybody in the gang. Yeah. So after the gang runs away, we have kind of the opening credit sequence, and it's the setup for. Like, three in a row of this assassin guy picking off members of the Gravediggers. Now, the first one is this faceless character, member of the gang, obviously, but he spends the opening credits, like, turning on his motorcycle. Yeah, prepping his bike. And the way they did the opening credits was really weird. Like, they would play the video, and then they would pause the video and the sound, so it's just silence as they show the names. Oh, like, two people at a time. And then they take the names away and start playing the video again and he'd flip another switch and then pause for names. Mm -hmm. And then they'd start playing again. It was a very clunky way. Yeah, there are aspects to it that I liked. I liked that we were watching how you turn on a bike while we were watching the credits, but I didn't like the pause. Yeah, it just seemed like a bit much. It did. And it dragged... They seemed to go out of their way in this movie to drag out moments. Yeah. Like, if you... and. And I guess I can't blame them because if you take away all those drag outs, like if you re-edit it, I'm willing to bet you can cut at least 20, 30 minutes out of the movie. Oh, easily. And then it would make it an hour. So they had to, I mean, the movie wasn't that long anyway. They were definitely padding it out to reach feature length. Which is a shame because I think there was more story to be told. Oh my gosh, yeah. So much more story to there be told. There was so much more to this movie that they just did not so they didn't get to. explain. Like, I spent this entire hour and a half expecting this to be a nearly three-hour thing. And so all of these little bits and pieces, I kept thinking, oh, they're probably going to come back to this right. and go into it deeper later. I was okay with the pace of the plot because I thought it was a two-and-a-half-hour movie. But now that right. I know it's an hour-and-a-half movie and that they never complete the plot, now I'm disappointed and left meh. Yeah. I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing that we're left wanting more, because it's a failing of the plot to give us a whole piece. But at the same time, like, we got into this world. Like, we got into the gang. We did. And they did a good enough job, like, sucking us into the world. Yeah. That you actually, like, wanted to spend time with the bikies. But there were just such big gaps 
that they that I think they should have filled in for us. Yeah. But then the ending was very abrupt and kind of oh. left you wanting more. And I'm okay with that. I'm okay with being left wanting more. Mm -hmm. What I'm not okay with is gaps in the plot. Yeah. And they did both. So one of the first big examples of padding that we see is I think we hear on the radio or hear someone over talking about how like 400 bikers are getting together to pay their last respects to this one member of the grave diggers that was killed. So yes. in that montage of three, one of those three was... Warranted a an all-encompassing funeral procession. Yeah. One was beheaded by a, 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 a wire war, suspended across the road. gruesome. One was exploded. So one lost a head and one was exploded. One was forced off the road, went off a cliff, and then like landed headfirst into the ocean. Yeah, so that was a that was a big drop. I'm willing to bet that's the one that the they buried one? because he was the most physically intact. Yeah. <laughs> I uh, something that they said in the exposition, I can't remember the source of the exposition about the the funeral and the but anyways, the source of the exposition said something about we didn't even really know that three bikies were dead until we saw the funerals because right. the funerals were like they were big. We didn't know people had died until there was this big to do. Yeah. Well, the guy who went off the cliff, that was very public. It was like in the middle of town. Yeah, like the coast guard would have to fish him out or right. something like so that. Right, so wouldn't they know that there was a dead man? That's hard to say. Yeah. Because, I, mean, I mean, none of the bikers are actually going to go out and report a death to the police. Right. But They're I feel like the police would have been, or the Coast Guard, or whoever would have been first on the scene with a guy flying off of this cliff yeah. and landing in the water. I mean, you can't tell me that, you know, the bikies found out about it first and went and fished him out before anybody else did. That just seems weird. Yeah. I'm going to chalk that one up to just... That's just... They needed it. They, they needed the story to be that way. They wrote it into the plot to make it easy on everyone. Yeah. I'm okay with that. Yeah. So the first montage of this movie is yes. just like 400 motorcycles riding along the highway. And I feel like after the opening that we got at the rally and then the, the three bikies getting offed by the assassin... I feel like this ride of the funeral procession was where they should have put those opening credits. Yes. Not pause the footage, but it was it's a long sequence it is. of just motorcycles. And I really liked the sequence. I oh, liked it looked seeing great. that many bikers all together. It occurred to me when I when we were watching it, they must have hired every biker yeah. in the country. Because <laughs> there were so many. And were there really four hundred? I'm not sure if there were actually 400 there, I didn't but count. <laughs> there was a lot. I would say there was at least 200 bikers mm -hmm. in those shots. And it was very impressive and very cool looking. They did go on a long time with it. And I, I agree. It should have been the opening sequence. The credits, the opening credits. Yeah. So they process along, and then once they actually get to the graveyard, they just kind of make sure it's just, it's just the grave diggers. Yeah. And it's... <laughs> I think when a lot of people think of stone, they think of this graveyard scene because they walk into the graveyard and they've dug like a hole. Like yeah, I was a little confused by the hole. Like not a not a grave sized hole. No, like, just like a person sized hole. Something you drop a manhole cover over, almost yes. like a sewer. Like I thought it was an opening for the sewers, which I thought it was a little weird that sewer pipes were running through the graveyard. But so they all gather around and that's where we get our first real good view of Vince Gill in this movie who plays Dr. Death. Yes, the hair and he's the got, teeth. Oh, he's got an eye, eye patch, patch and, and his top, top hat. hat. Oh my God. And his cape has a like pentagram, pentagram on the back of it. Yes. So the grave diggers are Satanists. And so they don't have like a traditional burial ceremony. The They just say goodbye. Yeah, the leader gets up and he says a few words saying goodbye and then Dr. Death comes up and he doesn't even, I don't even know if they have like proper prayers or anything, but he just shouts Satan at the top of his lungs. That was kind of it. As far as like <laughs> ritual, that was kind of it. Yeah, he shouts it and then he just kind of starts talking and it's i like their whole idea of we're gonna bury you standing up that way you don't have to take anything from the devil laying down yes i like that idea um yeah but okay the kind of so one guy so when they go to put him in the ground one guy jumps down in there yeah they pull the body out of the coffin and the body down hand yeah. the body down and then pull the living guy back out of the ground yeah so i guess i mean if you 
it's it's um uh, rude to just dump a body in the ground so yeah. they place him there gently with the help of somebody down in the hole so i guess that's how you do it when you don't have the crank thing and they didn't um they didn't bury him in the coffin that they brought him in yeah i i did find that a little odd because during this whole procession, the way they got this coffin to the graveyard is they had a motorcycle with a sidecar, but it's not a traditional motorcycle. It's Did you think it was specifically for this purpose? Like I they feel, have it. Like, I feel like they have a setup? custom made like hearse motorcycle almost. Yeah. For use when they need to bury someone. I got yeah. Yeah, it looked incredibly uncomfortable to ride, but it was a bit more ceremonial than just throwing it in the back of a ute, that's for sure. Yes. So I do like how they do it, though, because every man kind of steps forward and ha- says his piece. They say goodbye. Um, Toad comes up and he has this light cup and he's like, hey, you know, you always liked this cup and I'll give it to you now. And he tosses it in the hole. And I like it because they bury him with his vest and they bury him with his helmet. Yes. Um, did you get a sense that Toad did that out of guilt? Um, because Toad knows that that him witnessing the sniper is a is probably what killed the bikers. I think Toad does And you didn't say anything? I think Toad does have that that inkling that yeah. he might be the one at fault. Because Toad he says doesn't so say at anything. the end. At the very, very end, he says so. Yeah. But up until then he keeps it to himself. Yeah. So they they bury the guy that died. The guy. We don't even the three people that died that made such an impact on the biker gang. The one that they bury we don't know anything about them. The one that they bury, they do say his name and I think it's like up down or something like that. They all have bikey names. Yeah, they do. Um, so they mention it a couple times. I don't remember it, but they bury him. And as they go to, you know, fill in the hole there, the, his girlfriend or something is distraught. And she's like, no, no, no. And it's like the whole time we're watching, we're like, that's why people aren't allowed to hang around when, you know, coffins are buried is because people freak out like that. And every time we see someone in a piece of media hanging around as a coffin is like actively buried, it's like, like... they don't do that. No, not you anymore. Wait at least until you're gone. Like that's why everybody goes away. Right, and then the the worker guys. I almost call them landscapers, but I I don't really think they're landscapers. I think they are literal really? undertakers. Yeah, <laughs> like they're grave diggers. Exactly. Yeah. Once everybody's gone, they come and they you know put the coffin down in the ground and fill it in. Mm-hmm. So after the ceremony is done and they're filling in this grave, a couple of uh, police investigators show up. A couple yeah. Guys in suits. Yeah. And and in the background, you can see a couple guys in uniform. Right. They have a little bit I of think backup there. They're, they're hanging out in the background just in case, I think. Yeah. Just in case things get rowdy. So they show up and they're like, hey, we want to we wanna find the person who's killing all your guys. And the other gang members are like, you know, shove off pigs. Very, very rude. Yeah. <laughs> Not that they have much reason to be polite, obviously, because they're outlaws. But... Right. But they, they make it very clear that, that they are going to take care of this themselves. They are going to figure it out. Mm -hmm. They don't want the cops to have any part in it. They don't trust them. They don't believe that they're there to help. They don't want any part of it. Yeah. Which is, I I mean, what did the cops expect? That, that's part of why the bikies are who they are. Yeah. It's because they don't want to have anything to do with law-abiding society. So. Yeah. so they flat out refuse. And then they, I think at that point, they go to the bar that they like to hang out. And they yeah. toss out a bunch of construction workers and kind of take the place over. And it's at that point that they're all hanging around and we see a cut to a guy riding a motorcycle. And he is white pants, white jacket, white gloves, white helmet. He looks ridiculous. Yeah, he kind of does. And And he wears those gloves uh, through the entire movie. Just You know, the only like upside of those gloves is that when they're all riding in a crowd, you know exactly which one is stone. Very true. Because those white gloves with the long cuffs goes like halfway up his arm. Yeah, they're like cowboy gloves. Yeah. So this guy riding up wearing all white is Ken Shorter, our title character, Stone, who is a cop. And he is bound and determined to find the guy who's killing members of the Gravedigger gang. And so he shows up at the bar and kind of walks in. And of course... Everyone is immediately suspicious of him, and he wants to talk to the head guy, Gravedigger, who is played by... No, he wants to talk to the head guy, Undertaker, who's played by Sandy Harbutt, who is the actual, like, director and writer and all that. 
I didn't make that connection. Yeah, the I knew that the that the director was in the movie. I just didn't I didn't know that he was. Um, yeah, the president of the motorcycle club was the director of the movie. Yes, <laughs> and the guy who wrote it. So they are immediately suspicious of Stone, and he wants to ride with them. He wants to shadow them so he can find the the killer. And they're having none of it until like crossbow bolts start flying through the window. Yep. Like they, and he pushes. Who who was the target? I think it was. I think it was Captain Midnight. The okay. The 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 one black guy. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so he pushes that guy out of the way and, you know, kind of takes control of the situation, gets everybody down. Hmm. And I Chases think, the, yeah, the guy Yeah, he goes outside. out there and shoots, just shoots his gun out into the night. Yep. Um, but the so he kind of, he kind of earns their respect. Yeah. They kind of see, oh, hey, you have an eye for this type of thing. Maybe we should keep you around. Right. So I love that they take a vote. Yes. And even though the Undertaker being the head guy and Toad, who is sort of second in command. I think so. Yeah. Vote against Stone. The majority still voted for Stone. So he was allowed in. Yeah. So at this point, we get to kind of go around the room and meet the different members. Yeah, he calls them out by formally. name. We get a good look at their face. Yeah. I appreciate that because a lot of, with with these motorcycle movies, they spend half the time with their helmets on. Yeah. So you kind of have to learn who they are based on what they're wearing. Well, these guys are all wearing the same thing, so that doesn't help. They wear the same color helmet. They always wear black helmet, black visor. They all right. wear the same the vest. vest. Yeah. It's very So I appreciate that they took this time to name, face, yeah. As we're going around the room, we actually get to catch a peek of another actor who will be in a Mad Max movie later on, and that's Roger Ward as Hooks, yeah. who's this giant guy. He's much better shape in this movie. I didn't know that it was him. I knew Roger Ward was in this movie. I did not recognize it was him. Probably three quarters of the way through the movie, I say to you, hey, isn't Roger Ward in this movie? And you're like, yeah, it's that guy right there. And I'm like, no. Yeah. Yeah. That was right before the uh, the final graveyard That's shot. That's right, out. it was. That it was, was pretty much at the end. It was at the end. It was at the, at the final showdown. Yeah. I mean, he didn't have a mustache. He had he hair. Had hair. A very different look. Yes. And his, his size was very accentuated in this movie. Mm. He was gigantic. Yeah. And that was definitely like his role in the gang as yeah. like the heavy. Yes. And it was pretty tank. great. So they so at the beginning of the bar scene, the the bike bikey that was killed, his girlfriend comes in and she's kind of sulking and she orders a drink and one of the construction workers that are there give her a hard time. Yeah, he just like pushes her. Yeah. For like and he, does he even really say anything to her? Not really. He just kind of pushes her. Yeah. I'm like, I, I don't get it. And that raises the ire of the rest of the gang. And yeah. Like, holy cow, they kick the crap out of that guy. Yeah. Now she kinda keeps coming back as a f- feature in this movie and I think I don't even know her name. That's awful because they probably said it at least once or twice. Oh yeah. <laughs> so she was this dead bikey's girlfriend. Um Go Down was the biker bikey's name. Okay. And so she's all upset that her boyfriend died and then as Stone is integrated into the gang, she like starts warming up to him. No, that was a different woman. Was it? Yeah, because Godown's girlfriend was um, had dark hair, like kind of reddish brown. Oh my gosh. They're so interchangeable. Same haircut. <laughs> same haircut. It was, she had the same haircut. Yeah. Like short, like short, short, with like kind of long in the front. Um, And then the girl who kept hitting on Stone was blonde. Oh, I think that was Toad's girl. It was Toad's girl. Okay, yeah. It, it's tricky because if they have the same haircut, I think they're the same person. <laughs> It's not great. It's not a good quality to have. All right, we'll we'll skip her for now. So Stone shows up. He saves Captain Midnight's life, and they kind of say, "All right, we'll let you in the gang. We'll come pick you up tomorrow morning." Yeah. So the next morning, we get to see Stone at home, and he's there with his girlfriend. Her name is Amanda. Amanda, which apparently is played by Helen Morse, yep. who is in a town like Alice. Which was going to be on our hiatus list, but we can't find a decent copy. Yeah, a copy that is of good enough quality to make it worth watching. <laughs> right, so we're not going to watch it, but I would recommend it anyways. Steve Bisley's in that movie, which mm-hmm. is why it was going to be on our list. But Helen Morse plays the um, main role. Oh, she's Alice? Well, no. there's nobody. Nobody's named Alice. Oh. Alice is in reference to Alice Springs. Oh. Yeah. I gotcha. So there's no there's no person named Alice. 
Well, that shatters my uh, reality. <laughs> I always thought a town like Alice was referencing to a, a town like a person. Nope. A okay. town. She's trying to emulate. There's Alice Springs, which is like a bustling community. And she she is brought to this small rancher community. And she makes efforts to raise it up. Okay. To bring business to the town that will improve people's lives and to, um, I think she starts a, a shoe manufacturing that they out, that they, um, not import, but that they export. Export, thank you. Um, so she brings like money and commerce to this town because she's trying to emulate Alice Springs. Oh, okay. That's like half the movie. Other half of the movie is completely different. <laughs> okay. Anyways. <laughs> So, like I said, we get to see Stone at home with his girlfriend Amanda, and she works for a magazine, I think. Yeah, I think she's um is? yeah. She's not a model herself and she's not a photographer herself. So I think she is some sort of like the editor or like something. Like an editor, a designer or something. I got the implication that she was like an editor or a writer or some high up position in the magazine. Yes. She and made it very clear that she wanted Stone to ditch his job as a cop and come be a model for her. Oh, yeah. She hated the fact that he was a cop. Yes. Like. And once we got a good look at Stone, we both thought he looked like David Duchovny. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. If you look at Ken Shorter in this movie, it's mostly in the nose, the nose and the cheekbones. Yes. And the lips a little bit. Yeah. A little bit in the lips. But, yeah. Okay, I think... I mean, he's a handsome man. Not my type of handsome, but... Okay. Model type of handsome. You remember when we were watching Twin Peaks, like the old episodes, not the, the reboot? Yeah. I just forget David Duchovny's in Twin Peaks. When David Duchovny shows up and he's in drag. Yes. And With the long hair, yeah. And his character, I think, eventually transitions into a woman. But I think back then he's just in the habit of dressing as a woman. I don't think he transitions at that point. I think it's somewhere after the fact. Yeah. Anyway, picture David Duchovny from Twin Peaks dressed up as... Denise, as opposed to his Dennis persona, dressed up as Denise, and that's kind of like where I saw the similarity. Absolutely, because Stone has the long, dirty blonde hair or whatever like that, and that's really where it stood out. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Oh, so Amanda was kind of an interesting character. Uh huh. Very adamant, and I feel like. Well, I mean. Her addition to the story, I'm not sure exactly what it added. Well, to be honest, the addition, I'm not sure what addition to the story Stone brought, well, to be honest. The whole idea of this movie is that someone is killing the bikers, Stone is sent in to find the killer. He didn't find the killer. He didn't do anything. Right. <laughs> It's one of those things... The killer things, got himself found because he was stupid. It's one of those things where, yeah, if the main title hero had done nothing at all, the final results of the movie would have been largely the same. Yep. Absolutely. <laughs> it, His only role was for a POV character for us. Right. He was our way into the game. Yes. Which, that was effective. Because I think the most enjoyable part of this movie was getting to know the gang. Oh, absolutely. We got a little bit of personal history, only on a few of them. Uh, Gravedigger and Toad, I think we got some personal history. And then Midnight, we got some personal history. Yeah, a little bit. Uh, and just those just those three, you got a real sense that these guys, they have very different backgrounds. Like uh, Toad was a, a fighter of some kind, like mm -hmm. a boxer or a wrestler in the States. And kind of sounds like he got himself beat up pretty good. Yeah. Because he, he had wasn't, a bad manager. He had a bad like manager. And then who then ran out on him. And then Undertaker was a, a, a soldier a that soldier. got to the point where he didn't want to keep killing people. So they locked him up for insubordination or whatever that's yep. called. I don't really remember Captain Midnight's backstory. Um, It wasn't exactly clear. What was clear is that he learned to ride bikes out in the bush. That's right. That's right. And then he came, because he's the best rider yeah. in the group. And then he came into the city and found people to ride with. Yeah. And that's that's the scene where we get um, Toad gets this great monologue about what it means to ride. Yeah, but rewinding back to Stone yeah. getting picked up in the morning. <laughs> yeah, we're jumping all over the place. Yeah. So Amanda is really just ticked off that he has to leave, and then he just kind of goes. He hops on his bike and he meets up with one of the with Midnight. gang members. Was is it Midnight? That Midnight picks him, up? picks him up. I thought it was. Maybe not. Maybe I'm wrong. 
No, I think I, I don't think I'm right. I thought it was one of the the lesser, chunkier ones, one of the fatter guys. Yeah. Anyway, so they ride on like an extended montage. Another time of dragging it out. Yeah. Like, they could have cut. I don't know, maybe three minutes from this scene. Motorcycle shot after motorcycle shot. After, and like, it was beautiful. Oh my gosh, the landscape is gorgeous. Now, was this shot in... This is shot in New South Wales. So one state up from Victoria. I don't think it was in Sydney for, for sure. Um, it, maybe a suburb outside Sydney. It might have been... Because this, this shot in particular is very residential. So it was probably a suburb outside of Sydney. Yeah, it could have been... Like down the coast. Could have been any of the coastal cities. Yeah. Let me see if I can and, find... Yeah, the scenery was just breathtaking. Okay. Oh, it's, it's all in Sydney, Australia. Um, the list includes uh, Colonel on Botany Bay for the opening scene, the domain across from the Art Gallery of New South Wales for the public assassination, Lurline Bay for the stunt ride off the cliff, Gore Hill Cemetery for the cemetery shots. I mean, they never once do that thing that international movies do, where if you're in Sydney, you have to see the Opera House. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they did not. Now, I don't know the history of the Opera House. Was it was it built back in the 70s when this was made? But they, but you're right. They didn't do they didn't like outright tell us that we are in Sydney, Australia. Like every movie, every modern movie does that. If they're in Sydney, they make it incredibly obvious that they're in Sydney. Yeah. Construction started on the Sydney Opera House in 1959. So, oh, okay. So it's it was there. For a long time. And they didn't exploit it, which I appreciate. Yeah. Because the the town of Sydney didn't really matter in this movie. No. It didn't matter where they were. What mattered was the fort and the scenery. Mm -hmm. The fort was important and the location, all of, you know, the beautiful views and they were out away from the city. That, that's what was important. So Stone gets taken up to this old fort up on a hill. Yeah, which was pretty awesome. It oh. seemed like um, out on a bit of a peninsula. Mm -hmm. Does it say where that fort is? It's the uh, Middlehead Fortifications on Sydney Harbor at the gun emplacements. Okay. Let's see if I can open this up and tab. So the Middlehead Fortifications consists of the outer Middlehead Battery located at the end of Old Fort Road, the inner Middlehead Battery located at the end of Governor's Road, and the Obelisk Batteries reached by a path from the corner of Middlehead Road and Chowder Bay Road, Middlehead Mossman, New South Wales. The fortifications at Middlehead formed part of Sydney's harbor defense. That is the opening blurb for the Wikipedia page on the Middlehead fortifications. Okay. So, yeah, the gang has taken it over, and it's a fortified position where they're all essentially safe. They even ride their bikes down, down into, the fort. into the fort, which got really tight, made me so nervous. Gosh. Yeah, so they ride down a ramp, and then they're riding down this hallway, and they go around a couple of corners before they reach, like, a large room where they can park their motorcycles. And the only thing I can think of when they're riding their bikes down into this is how much of a hassle it must be getting everybody in, getting everybody out. Right, because most of the time when they travel, it's all of them. Yeah, but that's, you know, that's me nitpicking how <laughs> they want to lay out there. Their fort there. But as they arrive, Stone is brought in and he's given a few ground rules by Undertaker before he like officially gets to join the gang. And it's you ride at the back, you don't make waves, you keep your hands off the girls. He immediately breaks all three rules. Yeah. <laughs> So what they do is they get everybody outside and they give him his his jacket and he does this thing where it's like they give him do they give him pants they and a jacket they gave him pants and a jacket and they obviously belong to somebody else prior to yeah so he takes off his pants and they razz him about that they have a great time uh the pants don't fit so he gets to put his own pants back on I feel like they gave him the pants just to give him a hard time because yeah he puts them on and I mean it's a really far out shot it it's hard to see a lot right. But, like, you can tell, like, they're super short on him. Yeah, they, so make, they, they make a joke about flood something. Yeah, like, like there's, flood pants or yeah. something. So he ends up taking their pants off, puts his own pants back on, but then he puts on the... The vest. The vest, and this whole time we're watching, I'm like, there's there's got to be more to this. It can't just be that he gets to put on the vest and that's it. And that's really the case because... Hugh Keys Byrne comes up behind him and grabs his arm and they kind of wrestle him down. And Dr. Death comes out with something in his hands. Like, 
It's it's a really wide shot. We don't actually see what he has until we zoom in and he, we see that he's holding a syringe. And I'm like, oh no, they're going to get him hooked on drugs or something like that. Yeah. But, I thought they were going to shoot him up with something. But that's not the case. What they end up doing is they end up piercing his ear. Yeah. And giving him a little skeleton earring. Yeah. Which... It, yeah, it's just a mark of being in the gang. Yeah, I guess... And it's. If, if he's going to ride with the gang, he has to look like he belongs to the gang. Yeah, because one of their big things is they're really concerned about people knowing that there's a cop in the gang. Yeah. Like, they really want to avoid that. Yeah, so they conceal him. They don't, you know, they don't initiate him. They just give him all of the outward things that he needs to blend in. Yeah, so after they initiate him, then they head out as like a big group. Yep. And so as they're riding out, they are riding in two big long columns and they come to a stoplight and right up the middle of the column, here comes Stone. Yeah. All the way up to the front. And when he gets to the front, Undertaker's like, I told you to ride at the back. And he's like, oh, my foot slipped. Oh, <laughs> catch that oh i caught that and then that's as they're stopped there he's like well you want to drag race or something like that and so that's where they get the setup to go park somewhere and then have midnight race stone yes <laughs> so they go to this parking area and i guess there's like a circuit or something in that neighborhood yeah but they say okay captain midnight is the best rider out of the whole group if you can beat him you know and he doesn't even have to beat captain midnight he just has to keep up with him yeah he just has to do a decent job but like that'll earn him like mad respect and so they go off and we get another riding montage yeah at we... least this one has like real reason behind it yeah do we stay with them the whole time like, pretty much not a lot of cutting no like it's a lot of continuous shots uh -huh. of them riding yeah and Long and the short of it is that Stone loses control of his bike and he goes down. Yeah. Like he's taking Almost a corner at the too end, fast. He was he was maneuvering to overtake Midnight. Yeah. And he goes down. And it's within sight of the finish line. So everybody sees him and he gets a lot of respect for being so close behind Midnight and putting forth so much effort that he went down. Yeah. So he succeeded. Yeah. So they all pat him on the back and he feels good about it. But the next scene we see is he has to bring his bike to a shop to get like cleaned up. Yeah. I, I like this transition because from here we transition to him going around to different places that the bikers hang out. And talking to people about the gang. Yeah. So, so I like that transition. Yeah, it starts in the motorcycle shop. And that's where he sees, like, the new hot motorcycle that he ends up riding at the end. But he goes from the motorcycle shop to a restaurant where he's talking to the owner about how the gang always comes there. And he goes to, like, a nightclub. Yeah. Talks to that guy there. And they all love the gang. Oh, yeah. Everybody has nothing but good stuff to say about the gravediggers. Yeah. And they admit that, you know, they're not perfect. Sometimes they, the the restaurant, the guy who's making the burgers, like, yeah, they steal dumb stuff, like utensils and ketchup bottles. Yeah. Um, and he's like, but I don't really care because they keep buying my food, so. Yeah. And it's funny because Stone's like, well, don't they drive your business away? And he's like, no, if anything, people come to see the gravediggers. Yeah. Like, there are women that will just show up. Yeah. And, like, be there for the gang. Yes. Okay, the women real quick. The women! That was something that I found about this movie to be so much more realistic as opposed to Mad Max. In Mad Max, in the gang, yes, there were a couple of women. But I thought it was so much more realistic in The Grave Diggers. Every man had a woman companion. And I yep. think there were extras to go around. But they had companions who rode with them and who were dedicated to them. And that just seems so much more realistic than, than the gang in Mad Max that some of the men were just alone. Yeah. I'm like, that's not... That, okay, that's not how men work. No. <laughs> That's not how people work. People want companionship. That's yeah. why we keep pairing up. It's because you want companionship. So these guys in Mad Max running around without anybody, yeah, I'll buy it. Yeah. Well, lower uh, lower budget, probably. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I, I liked that there, there were so many women around. And they did seem... They were dedicated to, you know, a certain guy. It's not like there were just women hanging around having sex with whoever. There were couples. Yeah. Okay. So after the restaurant, he goes to the nightclub. Yep. And the nightclub proprietor, like another guy that just loves the gravediggers, like I said before. This guy's a little weird, though, because as he's getting interviewed by Stone, he's going around and he's 
making sure all the instruments are in tune or something like that. Yeah. So he's just like playing. Like he said, the first thing is like a xylophone. a xylophone. And as he's talking, he's like hitting the notes on the xylophone. And I'm like, is this a musical number? Or are we getting into <laughs> like a, something like that? But he goes from the xylophone up on stage and he sits behind the drums and he tells this story about how he used to have to pay protection to these guys that would come around and shake him down. And then one night the Gravediggers showed up to a show and they were following around this band specifically. The the Gravediggers and the band were connected. And so it just so happens that that night the guys that were pushing for the protection money also showed up. And the Gravediggers and the protection guys butted heads and the protection guys were thrown out. And ever since, like, the Gravediggers have made that their club. And so he's the only club owner in town that isn't shaken down for protection money because the Gravediggers are there to protect him. Yeah. And, like, yeah, he kicks the money every so often, but it's nowhere near as much as the protection racket. Yeah. So, like, these are super stand-up guys for outlaws. (laughs) Right. As far as outlaw goes... Like, in the context of them being, yeah. like, drug users and liking to live outside of the law, you know, typical, like, antisocial group, they're still, like, upstart people. Like, they're not bad guys. Yes. Yeah. And the only time we really see them... I mean, they beat people up a lot. Yeah. Like, they like to fight. They like to fight. And you can tell they have a good time. Like, they fight because they enjoy it. Yeah. But the only time they talk about really killing somebody is their intention to kill whoever has killed their three comrades. Right. So, I think after he goes and interviews all of those people, is that the scene? We get the corporate scene? Yeah. Like, out of nowhere. Out of nowhere. It's like a corporate boardroom and they're talking like, oh yeah, if we buy this piece of property, we can do X, Y, and Z and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, oh no, the corporate board scene is after they have the run-in with the other gang. That's right, yes, because they talk about the run-in. Okay, so So rewind real quick. Back to after he's done investigating, they're hanging out at the bar that they like to be at. Yeah. And another gang shows up. The Blackhawks. Yeah. So. And they have, they have a fight in the street. Yep. So the fight starts because the leader of the Blackhawks walks up and sees Stone's new flashy motorcycle that he picked up after doing all of these interviews. And he like pushes it over onto its side. And so Stone starts beating him down. And so then it's all the grave diggers and all the Blackhawks are fighting. Yeah. Until Undertaker walks outside and he takes a shotgun and he fires it up into the air to get everyone's attention. That sounds familiar. And I'm like, I understand that reference. Yep. Well, Mad Max reference in Stone, I guess. Yeah. Not that, you know, never mind. Don't let me get too deep into it. Anyway, so they chase off the Blackhawks. This was another instance where I think they were fighting for the fun of it. Well, Stone was fighting back because his bike was I know there was a little bit of insult involved. Everybody else was fighting because they wanted to. Yeah. (laughs) And then the leader of the Blackhawks, when he was like, okay, we're leaving, we're heading out. He was like smiling, like, hey, that was a good time. We're done. We're going to head out now. Yeah. So they, it didn't seem like they had a genuine beef, mm-hmm. the two gangs. They, maybe they don't get along as a rule, but it didn't seem that big. It didn't it's like they had a vendetta against each other or anything. Yeah. So it's after that fight that we go into that corporate boardroom showing thing because they are in a meeting and we don't really know who these corporate guys are but after their little meeting is over the assassin guy walks in and he's like hey there was a fight between the grave diggers and the blackhawks down at the bar and there were firearms involved and so the corporate guys are like oh well that's great we'll just you know lure him into a trap shoot him and then blame it on this other gang and so the assassin guy is like cool and it's like right why these corporate guys why do they want to get rid of the gangs yeah it's never explained fully like yeah we get a little bit of like a the last sentence of their board meeting. But it's like, we never really understand, like, who the politician guy was in relation to this corporation. Yeah. It's not explained very well. When I'm I, sure there's dialogue. Right. When I made the connection, which was embarrassingly late in the movie, that this was all about a real estate deal, I was let down. Yeah. I'm like, seriously, this is supposed to be an exciting murder biker story, and it's all because of a real estate deal? Yeah. It was kind of lame. I was I was disappointed when I figured out that that's what... And when I mentioned that to you, you like had it, you had it already all figured out. Yeah. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> it took me a long time 
to figure out what the deal was. Yeah, I wouldn't worry about it. (laughs) (laughs) So we go from the boardroom and then we see like another shot of like the assassin guy getting a bunch of guns together and whatnot. But we cut away from that to the gang hanging out in their fort. And I think this is them coming home for the day. Yeah. And is this when we get the scene of them sitting around smoking? Yeah. And talking. We got a lot of backstory. And... Yeah. So the scene starts where they all get into this common room, and then Toad's girl goes into the common area, and she sits down on Toad's lap. And, starts kissing him. And she starts kissing him. And then I think Undertaker walks in, sees her and Stone making out, and then he gets upset because one of the rules is keep your hands off the girls. And so he walks over, he slaps the girlfriend, Stone gets up, punches the Undertaker, because really it's the girl that's breaking the rules. And yeah. I think Undertaker was able to recognize that. Yeah. But Stone punches Undertaker, and then the girlfriend knees Stone in the jewels. Right, so everybody got a little something. Oh, yeah. And it just, it was a little nonsensical, like who was blaming who for what. But I like it. <laughs> I like that it sets up this idea that, like, there was a rule being broken, and so the punishment for breaking that rule was she got slapped in the face, you know, because she is not allowed to touch him just like he's not allowed to touch her. And so they have start this little conversation about how, you know, yes, their law in the gang is based on violence, but they ask the question, isn't all law based on violence or something like that? And they start really getting into this whole backstory thing. And it's an amazing, it's the best scene in the movie. It is. It is the best scene in the movie. (laughs) Paired with continuing the scene on to the next morning Mm -hmm. when they go for a swim in the ocean, like it's the best sequence of the entire film. One thing that I really like is a, we get backstory. I really like character development. It's one of my favorite things in movies, but they do this cool effect where, they're smoking marijuana or something like that it's rolled up into little cigarettes and so it's probably marijuana but they do this thing where the person on camera inhales and then like a voiceover starts up of that character yeah and then towards the end of the thing the person on camera they start talking out loud so it's almost like you get this whole kind of ethereal relaxed effect yes and there's some effect on the screen of, like, some waviness. Shimmering or something like yes. that. It's really cool. And everybody really gets a chance to speak and go into a bit of what makes them tick. Yeah. And it's definitely... You you never see the gang so relaxed as in this scene. Yeah, and it there's, really endears you to them. There's no fighting. There's no talking over each other. Yep. There's no razzing each other. They're just... They're all just, like, laying around and just talking. And I love it because the one thing they all have in common is that they were at this point in their life where they needed to be part of something, and then they found the gang. Like, it's not painted in such a way that it's a horrible, malicious thing. Like, this is them just wanting to belong. Yeah. And it, and it makes it very... Uh, Sympathetic is the word I'm looking for. Yes, it does. It makes it really easy to see them as people, not so much criminals. And I think the fact that Undertaker is the writer and director of this movie, I feel like that's the point he was looking to get across. That, yes, these are hard and gruff exterior people, but they're still human. Absolutely. You know, they're not always terrible people. And this is the scene that you mentioned before where Hugh Keys Byrne has that amazing monologue about what it feels like to be on a motorcycle. In this monologue, one reason I like it so much is he does the same thing as in Mad Max where he gets going talking and it's almost he's talking like he's saying Shakespeare. Yes. And it's he, that classical training. It's that classical training and you know the words are very not Shakespearean but the way he says it with the feeling and his cadence it's it's it feels like he's saying something important Mm -hmm. that you should stop and listen to he makes you stop and listen when he talks like that yeah and i think if i remember correctly in this movie this is really the only time he does that Mm -hmm. yeah this is the the most speaking that toad really does in this entire movie but it's great just because it's so true the idea that when you're up on that motorcycle and you're going that fast is like you are you feel powerful because you're able to command this giant piece of iron that's conveying you on at like 
hour fast. Like it gives a real sense of power and control and freedom and it's intoxicating. Absolutely. And I kind of like how they keep offering stone drugs and he keeps turning them down because like, oh, his drug is speed or whatever, that type of thing. And it's understandable, you know, going fast and being able to maneuver it's it's a great feeling. Yeah. So they they kind of all just fall asleep where they are. Mm-hmm. And Stone wakes up the next morning. Says, "Oh, the sun is up." And he make, he says it like the sun just came up. Like it's very early in the morning. He opens the window. It's like, oh, it's a great time for a swim. So he convinces them all reluctantly. They all follow him out to the beach where they all just strip down and run into the water. I appreciate. And there are boobs and butts and tan lines. All over the place. I appreciate Undertaker's initial reluctance to go in the water. Stone says, oh, it's a great time for swimming. And Undertaker says, yeah, it's a great time for sharks, too. And Stone says, well, we won't tell them we're out there. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, they all go down to the beach and they just strip down to nothing and go out into the ocean. And they're just out there swimming and carrying on and and having a good time. Frolicking, like throwing each other around. Like, two of, there's two men who've got a woman in their arms, and they're just throwing her back and forth between yep. them. So, yeah, this is them bonding uh-huh. and, like, growing closer together. And, yeah, there's just, just a lot of butts. Very strategically shot so that waves are at the right height or a dune is at the right height. Yeah, okay. The only thing that they were strategically protecting was penises. We never see who has. Uh, yeah, we do. What? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we do. I don't remember seeing any vaginas. Yes. Well, (laughs) vaginas aren't that easy to see, but there were some bushes. Okay. Well, I did see a couple of man bush. Okay, but man bush doesn't hide the penis. (laughs) (laughs) The waves and the dunes do. Okay, I don't want to go into... Yeah, we don't need to continue this conversation. I don't want to go into the the purposes of bushes. (laughs) They were more protective of the male genitalia than they were of the women. Uh, Probably because women's genitalia don't hang out the way men's genitalia does. Well, I equate, in in the spirit of protecting people from indecency, I equate men's genitalia to women's breasts. Like, those are, the, those are the outward things that society needs to be protected from. Well, I mean, that's not always equated. And there were, like, there's... And there were boobs. Throughout the entire movie, there were boobs everywhere. Well, I mean, there's the whole free the nipple movement where people are talking about, you know, if, if men don't need to cover up, then why do women have to cover up? And there's a meme out there of this guy who's really heavy set and he's got a really flabby chest. Yeah. And then there's a, it's put next to a woman with a fairly flat chest, but she's got a bikini top on. Yeah. And it's kind of exposing, well, he's got bigger breasts than she does. Why doesn't he need to cover up? Right. So there's that whole debate Yeah, there. and that's a whole thing that certainly wasn't yeah. back in the 70s. It might also be a cultural thing between America and Australia. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, there were there yeah, were a lot of boobs. Yeah, and Hugh Keys Burn, yes, he wore his vest, but he was largely oh, was he shirtless. Was the one that, that wore his vest into the water? No, that was someone else. Oh, okay. But you're, yeah, you're right. He pretty much just wore his vest yeah. the whole time. Not that he's like chiseled or something like that. No, but... he was a bit round bellied. Yeah. <laughs> With a glorious chest of hair, though. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I wouldn't say he was like heavy set. No. Just maybe like just not ooh. toned. Right. So they all go swimming and then they're hanging out afterwards and Undertaker's like, we should go to the bar. And Stone's like, yeah, but you've got beer here. And Undertaker's like, yeah, but everyone's bored. And he's like, well, what's safety? Like, safety is overrated. Yeah. And so they go to the bar for like the third time this movie. Oh, yeah. They they go to the fort, they go to the bar and that's it. Yeah. So it's at that bar where they had this little scene between two guys and Toad, which is, it is what it is. I don't know. I didn't get much out of it. I don't even remember just, the thing you're talking about. It was about. him just trolling them. Oh, yeah, that. With the cigarette and the yeah. drink and all that stuff. The it was unnecessary. Thing, it served no purpose. The important thing about the, the third trip to the bar is that the bartender pulls a helmet out from behind the bar. He says, hey, a couple of guys stopped by earlier, and they left this here, and it's... Go down's helmet, yeah. the guy that was which buried was at the buried of the with movie. him, and so they're like, "Oh, someone's messing with the grave. Who left this helmet?" And the bartender says, "Well, I didn't recognize them, but they said something about it being courtesy of the Blackhawks." 
And so Undertaker is like, okay, well, we got to go mess them up because they're messing with Godown's grave. Yep. And Stone is like, um, this is obviously a trap. Like, this is such a trap. And Undertaker's like, well, yeah, of course it is. Of course it's a trap. We're going to go spring it and catch the guys who set it. <laughs> and so Dr. Death and Hook, which is Roger Ward's character, they have like some submachine guns or something like that. And so as they're riding to the graveyard, Hook and Dr. Death go off on one side and kind of flank the graveyard, and then the rest of them kind of go up the middle. And as they arrive at the graveyard, like, they find the guys that are lying in wait, and they hold them all up. And it's like, this whole time, Stone is nowhere to be seen. Yeah, Stone argues with the Undertaker, you know, don't go, don't go, and he... And Stone does not go with him. He does not leave. He goes nope. back into the bar to make a phone call. Yeah. Which, nothing ever comes of that phone call. Exactly. It's not like the police show up and swarm the place. Nothing ever happens. So, they, there's a final shootout in the graveyard. Yep. They disarm most of the assassin's men, and then they find the assassin himself. And Toad is like, oh, hey, that's the sniper guy. Yeah. And so they give chase. Dr. Death is shot... Uh, Toad's shot a couple Somebody of times. Somebody else dies. Yeah. Because he says six in total. Yeah, so, so there's that, another death that happens somewhere. There's another death that happens somewhere. But they finally catch the guy, and it's then that Toad's like, oh yeah, he was the sniper guy from the thing, and I saw him. And they're all like, wait, is that why he's been hunting us down? Why didn't you say anything? And Toad's like, oh, I was tripping at the time. I wasn't sure what I was seeing, so I didn't bring it up. Yeah. And it's like, what? And he expressed some guilt. Yeah. But... <sighs> Why didn't you say anything? And then Stone shows up. I mean, they knew he was tripping. Yeah. It's not like he wasn't supposed to be. So, and then Stone shows up, and he's like, oh, you caught the assassin. Awesome. I'm going to take him in. And the rest of the gang is like, uh, no, we're going to kill him. And he's like, no, I'm a cop. You can't kill him. I'm taking him in. Okay, Stone Stone did have a good point. He's like, this is what I was here for. What did you think I was going to do? Yeah. This is what my job is, is to take this person in. Like, I would have thought the gang would have understood that. Yeah. Well, you remember when I read that blurb at the beginning of us talking about this where he has to choose between his job and his loyalty? No, he chooses his job. Yeah. His, There's no question. Right. His job, his loyalty to his job never wavers. Yeah. He's always a cop. That synopsis was complete crap. Yeah. So at the end of the movie, Toad dies. It's very sad. It is. It does go on for a little long, though. Oh, yeah. It's a very slow death scene. Yeah. He stays... Conscious. Yeah. So the entire gang is surrounding Toad, who's been shot in the stomach, which is a long... Like a couple times. Yeah, which is a slow death. Because he's dying from internal bleeding, so it takes... It takes a while. Like, he probably could have gone to the hospital and gotten help in the time it would have taken him to die. But anyways. So in the meantime, Dr. Death has been shot. Nobody realizes it. He's off in another part of the cemetery, dying all by himself. Yep, spitting at statues. Yep, spitting at the angel statue that is like looking over him, and then he dies. All by himself. That was sad. Yeah. So And then it goes from that scene in the graveyard to like stone at home with his girlfriend yeah and he's just back at home like normal and he's telling her about how great they all are and how they're his friends or something happy to know them and they have a sense of honor yeah and this is how the movie ends this is the last scene of the movie he says something like oh i'd be happy to see them anytime and then in through the door busts the entire gang and they swarm him they hold back his girlfriend they beat him up a really bad. A lot. A lot. For a long time. And we see a lot of it. And then they just leave. Yep. And he's left like bloody lying on the floor. And his girlfriend's like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, I'm going to call the cops. And so she picks up the phone and he like grabs her hand and she he hangs up the phone for her. And he's like, no cops. No cops. And I'm like, okay. And then the movie ends. And I'm like, oh, what? Yeah. Out of nowhere. In that scene, that was that was when I was about to ask how much more of the movie was left. Yeah. Because I'm like, this feels like a wrap-up, but it also feels like they could show us more. So I'm, I was curious where we were in the movie. Mm. And then the credits roll. It was a really bizarre ending. Very sudden. Sudden, yes. I feel bad that I didn't 
really like the movie. Mm -hmm. Because this has been called a predecessor to Mad Max, and I enjoy Mad Max so much, I feel like I was supposed to enjoy this movie. Yeah. And I enjoyed parts of it, <laughs> but as a whole... Yeah. So this movie has a 6.5 out of 10 on IMDb, and, and I don't think it has an entry on Rotten Tomatoes. <laughs> so... Okay, so I was flicking through the reviews, and I found this one that says, I'd just like to add that the version of this movie shown on TV and available on VHS, which is probably the one that we just watched, mm -hmm. um, available on VHS is cut. The original movie was about 20 minutes longer, but was cut for its American release, which seems typical. Yeah. And was only ever shown in full during its original 1974 release in Australian theaters. Mm. Seeing the full, ver the full original version ties in some of the loose ends, um, but has never been released. Okay. Yeah, I wish, I, I would like to see an uncut version. You know what I mean? Yeah. If I had known that this was a cut version, uh, I think if you had known it was a cut version, you would have attempted to find an uncut version. Right. The problem with this movie is that it's really tricky to find. I mean, this version we found on YouTube... Like, it was passable. It was. Quality-wise, it was fine. It's just the bizarre, the second half of the movie tacked on again. Yeah. Yeah. Plus, was it was 4-3 aspect ratio instead of regular 16 by 9. It um, just was not I was fine with that. as good as it could have been, of in my yeah, opinion. it could have been better, but yeah. it was fine. So, was there any part of this movie that really stood out to you as, like, your favorite part of the movie? Um, I have a feeling I know what you're going to say. Two things. The the funeral procession in the very beginning, mm -hmm. I thought was outstanding, beautifully shot. I love the idea of the gangs coming together to honor a fallen comrade. Um, and just the visuals of that many bikers going down the highway, I thought was spectacular. And then, of course, the, the scene in the common room where they were all high and chatting. Those were my favorite parts. I'd have to agree with you on both counts. Yeah. Because I love the part where they're all sitting together and smoking and whatnot. But at the same time... Just how visually impressive that opening procession was with just so many motorcycles all together, just awe-inspiring yeah. in its scope. Yeah, it was it was really great. And as really enjoyable to see. Great as that opener looked, like the amount of heart that that common room scene had mm -hmm. was heartwarming. Yeah. More than anything. I think it I think it says something about the movie that both of our favorite scenes were very meaningful. Yeah. You know, the it was a funeral procession where they were all coming together to show respect. And then and then the guys were, you know, they were spending time together and opening up and, you know, telling their story and talking about their feelings and yeah. What about least favorite parts? Um, I would have to say the, at the very end in the graveyard when they've, when they've tripped the trap and they've caught the assassin and, uh, between Stone and the Undertaker, I, all I could think of was Toe Cutter, um, between so the conversation between Stone and the Undertaker. I was okay with the conflict of the 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 the, um, the Undertaker wanting to kill the assassin and the cop wanting to arrest the assassin. I'm okay with that. What I'm not okay with was Stone had nothing to do with it. Yeah. He is going to go and take credit for something he had absolutely nothing to do with. That's when it really solidified to me the fact that Stone did nothing for this movie. Did nothing for the plot of the movie. His job was to be our eyes and he did that fine. But when it came to doing his job of finding the killer, he did nothing. Yeah, he was very lazy about it. Yeah. I think my least favorite part of this movie was anything involving Amanda. She was in there to complain mm -hmm. about the fact that he was doing his job. And yeah. I feel like they could have taken her away and given all of her screen time to actually exploring the idea of Stone being conflicted between his job and his loyalty to his new friends in the gang. Like, there is no screen time given to him talking to anybody about being conflicted or exploring this whole, oh, well, you know, if I ever find the guy that's killing them all, do I just let them kill the guy like it's never a discussion he's always very cut and dry i'm here to find the killer when i find him i'm gonna take him in it doesn't matter what the gang says and yeah. i feel like that would have been a great thing to include it would have added something to the movie and we just never get it and i know i'm kind of laying that at the feet of the girlfriend character amanda but at the same time she spent this whole movie complaining 
Yeah. She did. And never did anything to change her situation. Right. She didn't... She had nothing to do with the plot. She didn't help us to understand anybody's motivations. We didn't care about her at all. The only reason she was in this movie was so there would be someone with Stone after he gets beat up to have him hang the phone up. Like, yeah. her doing that phone thing at the end of the movie was her only reason being in here. Yeah, I kind of agree. If you ask me. I think, well, I I think the the contrast between his home life that we, that we go check in on a couple times throughout, we go check in on Amanda and what she's up to and listen to her complain, showing us that contrast between his normal life and his undercover life mm-hmm. could have been made useful in exploring his conflicted loyalties which we didn't explore. No. So that usefulness was wasted. What are your final thoughts? Would you recommend someone watch this movie? It's a really hard question. I think if you're a fan of Mad Max, I think you should watch this movie. It's it's very apparent why people say that it's the predecessor to Mad Max. Yeah. You're going to see lots of themes, and of course the actors that, that we see repeated great performances, and there's a certain feel about the gang that is... That Mad Max is reminiscent of. Mm-hmm. So if you're a fan of Mad Max, I would say yes. Yeah. Watch it. I'd Otherwise, say, you're not missing. I'd have to agree with you. This is a recommend, but with an asterisk on it. Yeah. If you are someone who loves motorcycles and loves movies about motorcycles, Stone is a motorcycle movie, and you will enjoy the motorcycles in it. If you are someone who really likes, you know, crime drama and whatnot, probably not going to be a great choice. Nope, it's going to do nothing for you. No. I got the sense watching this movie that instead of doing a 90-minute motorcycle drama, this would make an excellent 10-episode series on television because then you would get more time with each of the characters kind of like a sons of anarchy type of thing yeah like if this was a season of sons of anarchy it would make a good season i agree we could have gotten more into the three guys that were killed that we never even saw their faces nope we could have gotten into like who they are and why should we care that they're dead we could have gotten into all that kind of stuff we could have gotten into the politics mm-hmm. um if they were you know if they really wanted this whole thing to be motivated by real estate we could have gotten into that yeah like if someone did that and did a series with the plot of this movie and like the characters and whatnot i would watch that show yeah absolutely it's just when you boil it down into a 90 minute movie it just i feel like it loses something there and i can't recommend it emphatically to everybody right you know what i mean i have to have that asterisk on there kind of like braveheart like i can't emphatically say that everybody needs to run out and see braveheart you know like i said last week it's one of those things where, like, you know, you should see it because it's a cultural touchstone, you know, that yes. type of thing. This and is a cultural touchstone for Australian cinema. Yes, and I, I was going to mention that some of the, a lot of the reviews pretty much say that exact same thing, that this is a classic Australian film from the 70s. And if you're Australian or into Australian film, this is a must-watch. Right. So I think we'll leave it at that. Yes. <laughs> So be sure to come back next week. We got another movie in the can to watch that we will share with you. In the meantime, our website is madmaxminute.com. You can follow us on Twitter at Mad Max Minute. Like us on Facebook and join our listeners page, Mad Max Minute Beyond Microphone. Thank you for joining us. We will see you next week. I'll